My name is Rachel Hirsch, and I'm an attorney at the Washington, D.C.-based law firm of IFRA PLLC. Um, for those of you who don't know me and haven't seen me at the, our power booth station at these various shows, uh, I focus a large part of my practice on uh, advising online marketers and advertisers on compliance-related issues, and as well as, you know, on the state and federal level, as well as handling litigation or, you know, FTC cases as they arise. Um, David? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for coming. My name is David Graff. I'm the general counsel of a company called 50 on Red, which is a traffic platform, and we're here at the conference. Uh, and prior to uh, joining 50 on Red, I was the general counsel for an affiliate network for about six years, so some familiarity, obviously, with affiliate marketing and, uh, and the issues affecting affiliate marketers. Before that, I was uh, the general counsel of another company and I was in private practice, so I've been practicing for about, uh, about 15 or uh, years or so. Don't and date yourself. I, I shouldn't date myself. <laughs> uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay, so David and I chose today's title uh, session, which is entitled Why Compliance is a Tough Pill to Swallow, Nutraceuticals. And that's where your laughs come in, because that's a really funny title. Anyone? Hello? No? Okay. Uh, and so we chose this topic because we thought it was, you know, very appropriate, having gone to these shows and seeing how many people are in the health and beauty and diet space. and how scary it is that so many of these people really don't know what they need to be doing in terms of advertising compliance. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the problems that dietary supplement makers and distributors face are not just relegated to affiliates alone. It's, it goes all the way to the top to manufacturers, distributors, private label distributors, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we actually thought this topic was very appropriate five months ago, but given last week's um, FTC press conference on their new initiative on dietary supplement makers, we thought this topic was even more appropriate. So it looks like there's going to be continued and even stronger enforcement in this space. And so hopefully today's topic will give you some insight as to what you can be doing to avoid that scrutiny. Uh, so the first, let's talk about what are nutraceuticals. Nutraceuticals is actually a term that many marketers use to describe their uh, health and beauty products. It's more of a term of art than actually a legal term. Um, in fact, it has nutraceuticals have no fixed meaning in U.S. law. There's no term; it's not a legal term of art. So, depending on the, its ingredients and the claims with which it's marketed, a product can either be a drug, a food, or a dietary supplement. Um, the term is actually a combination of two words, nutrition and pharmaceutical. So it's been put together almost kind of deceptively, let's just say, because pharmaceuticals are drugs and nutraceuticals are considered to be non-drug use. Uh, it applies to products that range from isolated nutrients, dietary supplements and herbal products, specific diets and processed foods. So for many of you who are in this space, uh, I think the dietary supplements is what speaks to you the most. So let's take a look at what dietary supplements are. A dietary supplement is a product that contains uh, nutrients derived from food products that are concentrated in liquid or capsule form. In the US, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, and I'm going to call it DSHEA for short, so <laughs> it could be a tongue twister, um, defines a term. And it defines it as, a uh, dietary supplement is a product taken by mouth that contains a dietary ingredient intended to supplement the diet. So these dietary ingredients can include vitamins, minerals, herbs, botanicals, amino acids, <coughs> enzymes, organ tissue, glandulars, or metabolites. Um, they can also be extracts or concentrates, and they may be found in such forms as tablets, capsules, soft gels, gel caps, liquids, or powders. So given I've, that I've given you that definition, can someone here just quickly shout out to me a name of a dietary supplement that they can think of, a popular one? Anyone? I'm sorry? Green coffee? Yep, that's a good one. <laughs> Anyone else? These are the, the terms you hear at these shows. Green coffee, raspberry ketone, Garcinia Cambogia. These are all dietary supplements. How are dietary supplements different than drugs? Well, the reason why so many marketers choose to either manufacture or distribute or market dietary supplements is because generally dietary supplements do not need to be pre-approved by the FDA before they're marketed to the 
to, to users. So in the US, um, all prescription and non-prescription drugs are regulated by the FDA, but dietary supplements are treated more like special foods. Because supplements are actually not considered drugs, they aren't put through the same strict safety and effectiveness requirements that drugs are. So all the drugs you buy, even without a prescription, must be proven safe and effective um, before they actually are marketed. But supplements do not. So think of it, I guess we could think of it this way. In the US, uh, drugs are considered unsafe until they're proven safe, and they're proven safe through clinical studies. Dietary supplements, on the other hand, are considered safe until they're proven to be unsafe, um, meaning they're found unsafe after they've caused some sort of harm to a consumer. The DSHEA uh, says that dietary supplements cannot contain anything that may have a significant or unreasonable risk of illness or injury um, when the supplement is used as directed on the label or with normal use, even if there are no directions on the label. So really, it's a safety issue. Drugs, there's a safety concern. And with dietary supplements, there really isn't until a safety concern arises. But even though, and this is the big thing, even though your product does not need to be pre-approved by the FDA before marketing, what a lot of companies don't realize is that they must register their manufacturing facilities with the FDA. Um, we're going to talk about this in the later slides um, and what that means for marketers and specifically for private label marketers. The other big difference between drugs and dietary supplements is that with a few well, with the, with the exception of a few well-defined exceptions, I guess, dietary supplements may only be marketed to support the structure or function of the body, and they may not contain a claim um, to treat a disease or a condition. So there are three kind of categories of claims you can make about um, a dietary supplement or on a dietary supplement label. There are health and disease claims, there's nutrient content claims, and there are structure and function claims. The responsibility for ensuring the validity of these claims rests with the manufacturer, um, so the FDA regulates that, and in the case of advertising, with the FTC. Health claims are kind of claims that are pre-approved by the FDA. Um, they are statements that re relate a nutrient or food substance to a disease or health-related condition. Until 2003, the FDA actually forced manufacturers to have their evidence before printing any kind of health claims. But there are also a list of health claims that are considered A-list claims, which the FDA has deemed true. So for example, fiber may reduce the risk of heart disease, or diets high in calcium reduce the risk of osteoporosis. Those are typically approved health claims. Uh, a disease claim is somewhat related. It's closely related, uh, and it's somewhat like, for the relief of osteoporosis, take this product. That's a nutrient claim, a disease claim, I'm sorry. Uh, structure, structure and function claims, on the other hand, describe the effect that a substance has on the structure or function of the body, and they do not make reference to a disease. So an example of that would be uh, a calcium builds strong bones. That's a structure or function claim. Or this product promotes a healthy heart. As with all claims, structure and function claims need to be truthful and not misleading um, and do not actually need to be, again, pre-approved or authorized by the FDA. So to differentiate between a drug and a dietary supplement, the main thing that you'll need on your label if you're making a structure or function claim is the FDA disclosure, which many of you have probably seen. And it reads, these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So we just talked about how dietary supplements uh, do not need to be pre-approved before marketing. But there are times that you actually need to notify the FDA of a dietary supplement before you market it. So what are those examples? Uh, the DSHEA requires that a manufacturer or distributor notify the FDA if it intends to market a new dietary ingredient, or NDI, as we call it for short. An NDI is defined by statute as a dietary ingredient that was not marketed in the United States before October 15, 1994. So there's actually no authoritative list 
of dietary ingredients that were marketed before October 15, 1994. Um, there is, there's no also definitive list of any ingredients that were grandfathered in um, before that date. Some health groups have actually compiled lists of their own, but they're not exhaustive. So the best policy for any company that wants to manufacture a dietary supplement um, and has done it pre-1994 is to maintain its own records confirming long-term use of the ingredient, um, assuming, again, that the company marketed before 1994. Um, even the use of an ingredient in conventional food before October 15, 1994 does not determine whether the ingredient is an NDI. So even if, you, if the ingredient was present in food, if it was not marketed as a dietary ingredient, you need to make sure it could be qualified as an NDI. If, even if the product was marketed as a dietary ingredient outside the US before October 15, 1994, that could also mean that it is an, an, an NDI. So it has to be marketed in the US as a dietary ingredient for it to qualify um, as outside of being an NDI. Another thing that to keep in mind, and this is really important, is that changes in the manufacturing process for a dietary ingredient that was marketed in the US before October 15, 1994, may create an NDI. Um, an example of that would be an extract of plant leaves. If there's a different way of extracting the substance from a plant, that was done differently than before 1994, that may be um, a new ingredient. So for example, if you're using a solvent to prepare an extract from a pre-DSHEA dietary ingredient, it creates an NDI because the final extract contains only fractionated subset of the, uh, of the constituent substances in the original dietary ingredient. A, a really big example of this is a lot of people market raspberry ketone. So raspberry ketone is not actually something that was really around before 1994. And there are different ways of manufacturing and extracting raspberry ketone. So if your manufacturing processes did not predate 1994, your product may be considered an NDI. So if your product is an NDI, then you need to notify the FDA before you market it. So who, who needs to do that? This includes if you are a manufacturer who intends to market a new dietary ingredient, uh, a manufacturer who intends to market a dietary supplement that contains a new dietary ingredient, a distributor who intends to market a new dietary ingredient, or a distributor who intends to market a dietary supplement that contains a new dietary ingredient. And there's just a form that you can go on the FDA website um, to fill out for an NDI. And it contains you know, information like your complete name and address, and the name of the new dietary ingredients, and um, a description of the dietary ingredient and how it was manufactured. Um, and you just need to certify that. And once you get approval, you can then manufacture your product. David's going to take over to the next one. Sure. Uh, so before I jump into a discussion about the which agency in particular kind of oversees uh, dietary products or the market of dietary products, uh, one, one point Rachel made that I want to echo. So last week we were treated to uh, a press conference by the FTC uh, in which they announced a, a new initiative to aggressively pursue uh, companies and individuals that they feel are you know, unlawfully or inappropriately marketing dietary supplements. So if you, haven't, if you weren't aware of that or if you haven't seen that press conference, I suggest you may want to uh, go to the FTC.gov website and take a look at the transcript. It's not so much that, the, uh, that Jessica Rich, who did the press conference, said anything new or revolutionary in the, in the conference itself, but it shows you uh, an area of, let's say, concern of the FTC. And maybe to put it more bluntly, if the FTC publicly announces an initiative that they are going to be going after uh, bad actors in this space, then they will go after somebody. Right? Because the last thing they're going to do is announce an initiative and then a year from now not have anything to show for it. <laughs> So I think uh, just to set the stage and again to, to make this topic even more relevant, there will likely be some enforcement activity by the FTC at least in this area over the next year. And hopefully that won't be anybody in this room because, because in part because of this. So <laughs> I said FTC, sorry, I was focused on, there was an FTC press conference, but that's a great segue for me. Let's talk about the FTC and the FDA. So as, as most people I think know, we have a lot of different federal agencies in this, in this country, all of whom have uh, you know, specific tasks and specific mandates, but they often have overlapping jurisdiction. 
uh, or at least uh, areas where they are targeting very similar behavior. And the same is true for the FTC and the FDA. Uh, as Rachel said, the FDA has primary uh, responsibility for enforcing its labeling and packaging and making sure that the, uh, that the claims made and the marketing claims with respect to labeling and packaging are not false or misleading. Uh, the FDA tends to focus a little bit more on product composition and the components in the product. Uh, and again, like I said, they, they focus a lot on, on labels, but you'll see in a second that that's, their jurisdiction is not necessarily limited to the four corners of a label. Uh, the FTC uh, focuses on advertising claims, false advertising claims, and as most people know, uh, their power comes from Section 5 of the FTC Act. They look at unfair or deceptive practices. So if you pull back for a second, both the FDA and both the FTC are exam examining marketing behavior right, and looking to make a determination whether or not the representations, at least in their opinion, are unfair, false, misleading, deceptive, right, otherwise trick consumers. FDA focusing a little bit more on labeling, FTC focusing more on marketing in general. But of course, given the nature of, of internet marketing, the distinctions between, you know, in the past, what was a label versus what was the advertiser's ad copy versus what are third-party promotional materials, right, is, is pretty blurry. And, uh, and so you can't just assume that uh, if there's an issue with a label that you wouldn't get a call from the FTC or that uh, if there are ish, perceived issues with marketing that the FDA might not be, uh, might not be involved. And we can... Uh, we can go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, oops, can you, I should have I changed it on my computer. Oh. There we go. Yeah. That's what I meant to do. Um, so how do they work together? Well, they, they, have a, they have a symbiotic relationship, right? They, they are both, uh, they both work together to promote uh, the, the particular sort of goals in their particular mandate. Um, so, um, so for example, uh, the FDA uh, might send a warning letter to a, uh, it might be lawyers at the FDA surfing the web, they might see a number of representations that are being made on a site or a bunch of websites that they attribute to a particular dietary supplement uh, manufacturer. They may send a letter right, to that person saying, uh, they wouldn't say it like this, but saying something along the lines of, uh, I don't know what you're saying on your labeling, but those claims if made on a label wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be approved by the FDA or we would take issue with claims like that. Right? And I assure you they share this information with the FTC. Right? That may spark a call from the FTC. Um, the FTC uh, might send a letter to uh, a particular dietary supplement manufacturer and say, you know, we've looked at your claims. That, uh, we're, we're curious as to whether or not you can substantiate some of these claims that you're making. Um, you know, I doubt very much that the FDA would approve. And of course, the FDA will get a copy of that. Or at least would be uh, be in the loop. So they so they work together, uh, particularly because these days they recognize the kind of a gray area between again what constitutes marketing on a label, what constitutes marketing on a website, what constitutes marketing on packaging materials that might be associated with a particular uh, you know, a particular product. Um, let's jump. I'm just going to interrupt you real quick and just give an example that you all may be aware of, the Palm Wonderful example. Um, the FTC, in its uh, actual final decision in order, referenced the fact that Palm Wonderful uh, products were food and dietary supplements. And it also found that Palm was making disease claims. It went so far as to say that not only were those disease claims regulated by the FDA, but that Palm Wonderful should undertake certain types of controlled human uh, conducted trials for disease claims. And that's something really that's in the jurisdiction of the FDA to, to tell a company that you need to take steps to do clinical studies. And the FTC's order actually went so far as to point that out to Palm Wonderful. So that's an example of the, the blurred lines. Um, another quick example, if I may, is um, there's been speculation of whether liking on uh, Facebook or retweeting on Twitter may be construed as an endorsement for the content on that page. Um, Recently, the FDA actually issued a warning letter to a company called Amark, um, a dietary supplement company, for liking an unapproved claim regarding its product on Facebook. So that's, that, that's, you know, that's typically an FD, FTC kind of area, but liking a claim on Facebook by the FDA is now considered mislabeling your, your, your product. So it, you know, there's a blurred line between what constitutes labeling and advertising and the FTC and FDA straddle that line frequently. 
frequently. So let's look at a case study. Some of you may be familiar with, uh, with this. There are, unfortunately, there are no shortages of case studies that we could use uh, with respect to internet marketers, marketing dietary supplements, and running afoul of the FTC. Uh, the, the company in question here, uh, Central Coast Nutraceuticals, um, was found by the FTC, or I should say, they, let's just say it this way, they, they were investigated by the FTC, they ultimately settled with the FTC, and the FTC's allegations were that they were marketing their dietary supplements, they had two, one was an acai berry product, the other was a colon cleanse, that they were marketing them in various ways that were unfair and deceptive. Um, and I think those of you who are familiar with how many of these products are marketed uh, will, will, can probably guess at the ways in which this product was marketed and the issues that the FTC had. Among other things, uh, they thought that the claims that were made about weight loss were very aggressive, you know, five pounds a week or what have you. They thought that the uh, uh, there were statements in there about how the trials were risk-free or free trials, et cetera, or, and that consumers were um, entitled to full refunds, but the actual practice was, uh, uh, was such that consumers had a very difficult time uh, getting refunds, and we know how the uh, free trial aspect works. Uh, the FTC felt it wasn't adequately disclosed that the free trial was for 14 days, and then you had to send the product back, but in addition to sending the product back, you needed to call the company and get an RMA number, a specific type of code that you then needed to be put, that be put on the package. They made it very difficult, in other words, at least that's what the FTC alleged. Then they were implied, uh, well, there were concerns that they were Im implying that uh, Dr. Oz and Oprah endorsed the product. I think these are things that most people are, are familiar with. Um, and you and, continue to do, unfortunately. And continue to do, right? <laughs> and I think what's interesting here is, you know, you can perhaps point to some of these individual things that I just mentioned and maybe say, well, there might be an argument as to why this isn't a problem. But you have to pull back for a second and, and understand the FTC is looking at kind of the totality of the circumstances. And when they see uh, aggressive claims, when they know that consumers are complaining because they can't get refunds and chargebacks, they see the pictures of, of Dr. Oz and Oprah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. For, well, I'll say the FTC is likely to conclude that there's a problem. One thing I want to mention about these uh, settlements, which I think is interesting, and this is something that the FTC seems to do a lot, is that the settlement here was for $80 million, which is a lot of money, but it was suspended. It was suspended upon payment of $1.5 million uh, by the folks who, were, uh, who, who settled this. Uh, the $1.5 million penalty was, I think, pretty significant because it appears that the folks here had to disgorge, not just disgorge some of their profits, but had to sell assets, sell personal assets, in order to satisfy uh, that one and a half million judgment, but the question is, why is it why eighty million settled, you know, off or suspended if you pay one and a half? Well, it's because the eighty million dollars sort of hangs over the marketer's head like a sword of Damocles for a, a long time, right? So, what, what uh, a couple things could happen if the marketer fails to comply with the uh, with the settlement uh, agreement later on down the line, because the settlement agreement has other prescriptive measures in it. Uh, restrictions on the type of marketing that uh, can happen, or perhaps if other assets are discovered and the marketer wasn't perhaps very clear with the FTC about all of the uh, all of the profits they made, that eighty million dollar judgment comes back in, right? which is a problem. And they call uh, that an avalanche clause in the settlement agreement. At least the FTC this morning called that when I talked to them about one of my cases. And it's if they've misrepresented something about their financials um, when it came to settlement they claim they couldn't pay, and later the FTC finds out that they could pay, the avalanche clause kicks in and then they become liable for the full judgment amount. Avalanche clause is, a, is perhaps a nice way of describing it. Just remember that you're underneath the avalanche if you're this person and there's a problem. And uh, I've seen a couple of other uh, settlements in this area that are, the, the difference between this, the, the suspended amount and the settlement amount is significant. Uh, uh, the Jesse Willems settlements had a, a a, a settlement amount of $360 million to be suspended if he paid about $500,000. Um, it shows you perhaps that the FTC was upset with what uh, he was allegedly doing, and so they've put a pretty big, you know, pretty big, I'm going to use your phrase, oh, there's a lot of rocks in that avalanche if they, uh, if they find that he's doing something. So it, it's Another aspect of these settlements, just to remember, is everybody focuses on sort of the, the money, understandably, but these settlements often have monitoring requirements and, uh, and prescriptions that go on for years, 
20 years is not uncommon. Right? It's Which standard, means, probably very standard in the cases. 20 I don't years think I've ever seen less than 20 years, right? Right. Um, it's possible it's out there. But it basically would prohibit, like for these guys, they're prohibited from marketing products with negative options. They're prohibited from doing a lot of other things. Right? And this stays with you. And if you violate it, you, you get buried by the avalanche. And it stays with your business partners because once they have reporting requirements, they have to report about the people they do business with. So it's very hard to want to do business with someone who's going to report you to the FTC for having done business with you. And you don't want to become on the FTC's radar having not been on it before because you do business with somebody. So it's really a death toll for these companies because no one really wants to do business with them in the future. Yeah, I'm so, and one other point to make on that is often if you're an affiliate marketer, uh, let's say that in this particular place you have a dietary supplement manufacturer who signs this, They're, they've technically agreed to try to force all their affiliate partners who are marketing their products to sign this consent order. This is something that I had to deal with when I was the general counsel of the affiliate network. We would get these letters from uh, some of the manufacturers saying, can you please sign on to this FTC settlement order? It's not something that we often did uh, because they want to voluntarily sign on to somebody else's consent order. But as Rachel said, it, it makes it difficult for you to stay in business. That's true. Before. Okay, so just another case example is recently, a couple months ago, the uh, FTC announced that it was taking action against a company called HCG Platinum Diet Products um, that sold what they called homeopathic dietary supplements. Um, HCG is actually a hormone found in the urine of pregnant women. So people think for some reason pregnant women can help lose weight. So, <laughs> so they manufacture a dietary supplement um, based on HCG. Uh, the warning, the letters, um, to this company actually came two years prior from both the FTC and the FDA. They were one of seven companies that received a warning letter about HEG and marketing HEG products. But it took a full two years later for the, the FTC actually to file its case. Uh, and the biggest issue there was that the FTC was saying that the drugs, what they are selling is actually a drug and not a dietary supplement. And there are actually no approved um, HEG products by the FDA. So that's just another example of a dietary supplement under attack of late. So again, what are some of the red flags here? Uh, there are many, and one of the things I think that is interesting about um, <laughs> this area is that we now have several years of uh, enforcement activity in this area, a number of FTC settlements, a number of actions by state attorney general's offices. We've seen a number of uh, private lawsuits uh, biggest ones initiated by uh, Oprah Winfrey's companies and Dr. Oz's companies going after people for using their images without authorization. And yet, notwithstanding all of that, uh, if you go online today, you'll see the exact same types of behaviors and claims and issues uh, that got people into a lot of trouble a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm not sure what conclusion to draw from that, uh, but, um, but a lot of people's marketing practices haven't changed uh, given, I think, we, what, what the FTC has already uh, identified as problematic behavior, uh, if you're doing, if you're engaged in some of these practices, it, it might just be a matter of time before you get a, a letter you don't want to get. So what are some of the flags? Look, aggressive weight loss claims, claims where people are losing, you know, more than two pounds a week. Uh, you know, in my time, I've seen claims that people will literally say, you know, lose 40 pounds in two weeks, you know, three weeks. I think you'd have to lose a limb. Um, it's called starvation. Right? It, right. Uh, so I, I think we all know what they are. I mean, aggressive weight loss claims. Um, no matter what you do, eat whatever you want. Don't exercise. Sleep all day. I haven't seen that one. But, um, you know, and you'll lose uh, pounds and pounds and pounds. Um, I think, um, I just like these. Uh, the claims that say that you can lose weight by rubbing products on your skin. Um, outside of some acid or something like that. I don't think there's any such, uh, there's any such substance. And I think that, um, uh, again, this is, this is an area that's a little like obscenity. I think we all know it when we see it. Very aggressive weight loss claims in this area are a red flag for the, uh, for the FTC. In addition, and this is particularly appropriate or I think relevant for affiliate markers, um, the FTC and other folks are now well aware of the practice of using uh, blogs and quote blogs and quote news articles uh, to market these sort of products and uh, maybe you've heard the term the term I like is flog or farticle right phony blog phony article 
right? So the, the blog being, you know, I am a mom of two that lives in Reno, Nevada, I use this miracle product, I lost weight. Or the farticle being, you know, I'm News 11, you know, Channel 11 News, I've done this in-depth report on, you know, green tea, and here's, here, uh, here's what my study reveals, right? Uh, not to put too fine a point, a point on it, those are almost always false. So let me put it this way. If you're a, an affiliate or a dietary supplement manufacturer, and you want to market your product or you want to allow other people to market your product with sort of real life case studies, you really need to make sure, right, that these are bona fide consumers, that you've got the studies, that you've got affidavits from them, that you have permission from them, that you've got legitimate before and after pictures. Uh, this would be going to be a small minority of people, but, um, but if you don't have that and you market these products and you get a call from the FTC, there's really not much defense. Either these people exist or they don't exist. And it's very difficult to, uh, to defend yourself uh, from a charge that your practice was unfair or misleading if you've literally made up case studies. One other point, uh, postings on comment sections on either affiliate-driven pages or other websites where consumers allegedly post things talking about how great the product is to make sure that those are real. Uh, otherwise, that's, that's also a big red flag for the FTC. Oops. Let's go back. Okay, so which claims should advertisers be aware of when they are marketing their dietary supplements? You know, the FTC's truth in advertising laws can really be boiled down to two common sense issues. First, your ads need to be truthful and not misleading. And second, you need to make sure you have adequate substantiation for your claims. So, an, you know, a deceptive ad is not one that only makes an express claim. You use this product, lose 40 pounds. A deceptive ad is also an ad that makes an implied claim by picture, showing pictures or images that show someone who lost a lot of weight without actually saying this product will cause you to lose a lot of weight. So first you need to look at all your express and implied claims and see if they're deceptive. But there's also other issues that commonly arise when you are marketing dietary supplements. For example, claims based on consumer or experiences or expert endorsements. And David just touched upon that a little bit. I see this a lot with consumer endorsements. They have to be real people. You can't use fake consumers, okay? That's not gonna cut it. People need to know that real people took this product and had real results. But you also need to make sure that you tell the consumer that your results may not be the same as a person who, who is testifying to it in this advertisement. A lot of people would like to use the disclaimer, results may vary. Unfortunately, that disclaimer doesn't work anymore under the FTC guidelines. You need to let the consumers know what the typical or average results would be for someone using this product. So for example, if you were marketing a weight loss product, you would say the typical consumer can expect to achieve X amount of weight loss in X amount of weeks. And that's the disclaimer that you would use under a consumer testimonial. You need to make sure that people know that just because it happened for somebody else does not mean it's going to happen the same way for them. The other issue comes up with expert endorsements. You have to disclose if your experts are qualified to make the endorsements that you are putting in your ads. So for example, if you are selling a weight loss product but have a cardiologist as your expert, you need to disclose that the cardiologist is only qualified to endorse cardiological issues. It's not a nutritionist or someone else who's qualified to make dietary claims. In addition, if your expert is being paid for that endorsement, you need to disclose that as well. Um, many experts are actually business partners with the folks who are running the page, and you have to disclose that relationship and affiliation as well. An another big issue are claims based on traditional uses. What does that mean? Um, for years, raspberry ketone has been you know, touted as a weight loss miracle by, you know, Native Americans, for example. Okay, that may be true, but you need to make sure that those claims are accurate and you need to qualify those claims as well. Um, the consumer perception matters. What consumers see on a page is what is the FTC is going to look at to see if your page is deceptive. Um, and if you're going to base it on traditional uses, you better have scientific support to back, back that up. So, for example, if you're going to say university studies prove that taking this product can help 
shed pounds, you better be able to prove, show university studies that demonstrate weight loss. You can't just make that claim without actually having university studies to back that up. The other uh, claim you need to be aware of is when you use the, dis the FDA disclaimer we talked about before. Um, it may be necessary to include that disclaimer not only when you make an express written claim, but when your text or images lead the consumers to believe that the product has gone, undergone FDA review. So if you're making some sort of disease claim or some sort of image that has a disease claim, you need to include that disclaimer. Including that disclaimer, though, however, does not cure a deceptive ad. You need to, it's not like a one-off, I'm going to throw this disclaimer in there and therefore it cures everything else that's wrong with my ad. It needs to be there thoughtfully and it needs to be there in addition to substantiated and well-proven facts that you're going to, claims you're going to make in your ad. Um, the other thing is third-party literature. Uh, citing to newspaper articles, um, non-scientific studies, uh, books on the subject. You can do that as long as you do it non-deceptively. That means if you're going to cite a study, make sure you've read the entire thing. Don't just reprint a section of it taken out of context. And if it is taken out of context, disclaim that fact. I mean, it's not going to really help you to do that, but make sure you know what you're putting in on your pages. Um, up for the FDA, if you're making, if you're citing to a clinical study, for example, whose title has a disease claim in it, to support a dietary supplement, the FDA may consider that as a drug claim. So you better be able to have uh, support for your dietary supplement if you're going to cite to clinical studies that make drug claims. Just you have to be very careful what you cite and don't throw in studies in there that have nothing to do with your product and just make passing reference to it. So real quick, what constitutes health claim substantiation under the FTC guidelines? Um, the FTC has typically applied what's called a substantiation standard of competent and reliable scientific evidence to claims about the benefits of, and safety of dietary supplements. Um, they define competent and reliable scientific evidence as tests, analyses, research, studies, or other evidence based on the expertise of professionals in the relevant area that has been conducted and evaluated in an objective manner by persons qualified to do so, using procedures generally accepted in the profession to yield accurate and reliable results. I think for me the most important part of that definition is objective, meaning using, doing, having independent studies, not studies that have been done internally. Um, there's no pre-established formula under the guidelines as to how many or what types of studies need to be um, used to substantiate a claim. Um, the gold standard that they used um, for studies are double-blinded, random, stu human-controlled studies. That's the gold standard for F um, FTC, FDA. Um, for the FTC, the absence of an FDA determination that a health claim is scientific valid, valid will be a significant factor in the Commission's assessment of whether uh, of the adequacy of the substantiation for the claim. So this is how the two agencies interact. They look to each other for guidance as to what substantiation means. So just put a little chart together of the um, substantiation guidance compared to the FTC guidance, the FDA guidance. They're actually pretty much the same, but they, they split them up a little bit um, differently, if you will. So the FTC looks at the type of claim you're making. They look at the benefits of a truthful claim. They look at the costs of developing substantiation, meaning is it going to cost you more to develop, to have substantiation for a claim, or is that going to detract from making the product? Um, the consequences of a false claim, um, the amount of substantiation believed to be reasonable, and of course the type of product that you're, you're marketing. Um, the FDA has adopted this, is, uh, the guidance from the FDA is looking to adopt the substantiation standard, and they look at the meaning of the claim, the relationship of the evidence to the claim, the quality of the evidence, and the totality of the evidence. So they're really looking at your product as a whole. Do you have, you may have one clinical study, but is it supporting the claim that you're making? Is it a quality clinical study? Um, is it based on human, is it a human study, or is it an animal study? People will rely on studies like rat studies for muscle boosters. That's not going to really tell you how normal human beings are going to react in taking your muscle booster. Um, so this is, these are all the issues that 
the FTC and FDA look, look at to see if you've substantiated your claim. So this is really what's key for everyone in this room and most of the people out there who didn't have VIP passes to get into this room. Um, who does this guidance apply to? So it's not just the manufacturers, but it, it applies to product distributors as well. According to the FTC, uh, a distributor who, contact, who contracts with the manufacturer to manufacture dietary supplements, which the distributor then distributes under its own label, has an obligation to oversee product labeling, manufacturing activities, and product distribution. So this is the white label or white, um, private label or white label scenario. The FDA considers private label and white label to be own label distributors. So just because you're not manufacturing the product yourself and farming that out to a third party does not mean that you are not responsible for the manufacturing processes and what goes into that product. So just a few ideas of what dietary supplement marketers can do to protect themselves from liability. So first, let's look at the, the labeling, which is under the purview of the FDA. So excuse me. review all labels, including reference website materials, um, for indications of health or nutrient claims and implied disease claims. Remember, we were looking at structure and function claims for dietary supplements, not health or disease claims. Including your website on your label, according to the FDA, is considered part of their jurisdiction. So if your website is, has a link to your website on your label, any claims you make on your website will be under the jurisdiction of the FDA. So if there is a, a disease claim or a health claim, the FDA is going to look at that when they look at your labeling. Make sure your labeling includes a statement of identity, who you are, ingredient statements, that's most people do that, the net ingredients, the name and place of the business, the phone number, any material information about the use of the product, including warnings or side effects. It's really important, you know, the name and place of the business and phone number is really important because they want people to be able to report serious adverse events that <laughs> occur as a result of taking your product. And it's really the manufacturer and distributor's responsibility to keep a record of those serious adverse events and report to them. So for example, I took a, I took a uh, green coffee bean product and I started having severe heart, heart palpitations. I'm going to call the manufacturer and let them know. The manufacturer then has to report that event um, as a serious adverse event that occurred as a result of taking their product. And please, please do not base your labeling on what's already in the market. Just because another muscle booster or another raspberry ketone has something on their label, do not copy and paste and put that on your label. Make sure your label is tailored to what you do and what you manufacture. Uh, let me just echo that point for a second. It, not only does that apply to, uh, to labeling, but that applies to your websites or other marketing websites, et cetera. This is an area that uh, the marketing promotion of these uh, products is, is rife with sort of copying, and uh, people look to see what other people are doing. And what you can have is, uh, <laughs> is one sort of popular uh, ad copy out there that is bad or deficient in a, in a lot of areas, and people see it a lot and assume that it must be uh, it must be legitimate and then copy it and then and then model their own sort of websites after it and all they're doing is perpetuating right what are what are problems so you really have to do your own independent analysis don't just assume that because you've seen somebody else's website or a series of other websites making a series of claims that those claims are are legitimate if you want to take out the claims section since it's sure I mean I think it's it's sort of what we said before and we should make sure we've got time for questions but um, Look, at making overblown and exaggerated claims. Um, if you're if you're making weight loss claims, right, uh, you should at least understand that any claim that this product is going to make a person or cause a person to lose more than two pounds a week is probably going to get flagged. Is is a flag at least for the FTC as an overblown or exaggerated claim? Maybe you've uh, um, come up with a miracle weight loss drug, in which case I congratulate you and I want to give you my business card. But. Um, <laughs> It, Mine too. <laughs> um, but, um, but you need to be careful about, uh, about claims like that. Right. Uh, that brings me to clinical studies. People think including a clinical study is going to just save their ad copy, and that's not true. Make sure you only reference clinical studies that are relevant to your product and qualify them. So for example, if you are studying, again, I'll go back to the classic raspberry ketone. Raspberry ketone is the active ingredient. If there are clinical studies on that, 
make sure you qualify the fact that only the active ingredient has been studied. Many of the finished products include other ingredients like bark, wood, name it, whatever it is. I have no idea how bark and wood interacts with raspberry ketone, nor do you if you have not done a clinical study. So do not claim that your finished product has been studied if in fact only the active ingredient has been studied. If you're going to conduct uh, clinical trials, you have to register them with, the, with clinicaltrials.gov, with the FDA. Again, also do not reference uh, clinical studies on your website that make implied drug claims. Manufacturing practices, and this is big for people who are distributors or private label distributors. Make sure you select a manufacturer wisely. Do your homework. Go to the FDA website. See if they've ever been issued a warning letter. Those warning letters are public. They remain on the website forever, even if the matter has been closed. See what their reputation is in the field. Don't just rely on the manufacturer to tell you that they have good manufacturing practices or that they are GMP certified. There is no such thing as GMP certified according to the FDA. Okay, so you need to make sure that you do your homework and conduct your own, what I call a mini style inspe FDA inspection of the facility and ensure that they are, in fact, employing good manufacturing standards, that they have standards of procedures, quality control, reporting of serious adverse events, um, procedures to take uh, care of product recalls if necessary. And there are consultants that you can hire to do these kind of inspections for you before you enter into a manufacturing agreement. And when you do enter into a manufacturing agreement, make sure you negotiate it. Don't just sign what they give you. Most of these companies are amenable to changes if you do send them to them. You have to take uh, consideration of issues that may arise. For instance, if your product is tested and it comes in below specification, who is going to take care of recalling that product if necessary? Is that going to be your obligation? Are you going to be out the money? Or is that the manufacturer's obligation because they provided the specifications for the product? So those are the issues you need to keep in mind. So David's going to talk about what the consequences of non-compliance are for the FTC real quick. Uh, well, they're bad. Um, <laughs> you've seen some of the settlement uh, uh, agreements that are out there. Um, the way that these usually starts is you, you, can get, you can get a letter from the FTC asking about uh, uh, some of your practices. More aggressive is you can get essentially a subpoena, a CID, from them asking for records. That's usually the start of an investigation. Investigations are not public, right? Uh, so you don't, I think maybe the point I want to make there is you don't know who is being investigated by the FTC, right? Could be, you know, we'll make it scary. It could be your friends and family. You wouldn't know um, because the investigations are not public. You only know when there's an announcement of a settlement and a press release like we've seen or if there's a, if the FTC files a complaint, which they sometimes do when they are particularly upset about something. Um, so uh, if you're really lucky, you'll be able to, if you get a letter, if you're really lucky, you'll be able to explain to the FTC to its satisfaction that whatever you're doing is not necessarily a problem and maybe they'll close the file. Or maybe uh, you'll be able to negotiate a settlement that is a non-cash settlement. Perhaps you could say that. Sometimes I call this, it's not really no harm, no foul settlements, but you'd say, listen, you know, we're, we have good intentions here. If you have a concern, we'll promise to do it. X in the future, we don't necessarily admit that we were doing anything bad in the past. And depending on what it is, I, I've seen those and that can happen. But um, certainly the more severe consequences are the ones we've just discussed. You may have serious financial penalties. I guarantee you, your legal fees will be high, right, while you fight this. Guaranteed. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, you uh, could be restricted both personally and through your professional corporations, right, in terms of the type of marketing activities you're allowed to take. To, to, to do uh, in the future. And you could be subject to you know, decades long monitoring by the FTC. That's right. Um, for the FDA, the FDA will, if they're, if they're going to come look at you, they're usually going to conduct an unexpected inspection of your facility. And if there's issues, they're going to issue what's called a form FDA 483. That'll communicate what those issues are, and then you have to address them. If you get one of those 483s, you need to respond within 15 business days regarding a plan of action. You need to respond. Do not tell the F FDA to go pound sand. You need to respond and be courteous of them and, and show them that you're taking their concerns seriously. Um, all FDA warning letters are public, again, even if the matter is, is closed. And even after clean inspections, the FDA may decide that it wants to take action against you. Um, 
either in a consent decree, a seizure, a product recall, or, or even criminal action. If there is a death that's associated with your product, that's going to be criminal. So if you want to look at the difference between FTC and FDA, uh, the FTC is usually going to come after money, or the FDA is going to shut you down completely. And just a couple sample FDA warning letters that we included, but for the uh, interest of time, I'm just going to go to the, our last screen, which is, who cares? How is anyone going to find out what you're doing? Well, there are several ways, right? Yeah. So state AGs, you know, consumers calling to complain. I get this all the time. Clients send me letters from state AGs saying, I want a refund of this product. It's a fraud. If a consumer calls for a refund, just give them the refund. There's no reason why that needs to land on the state AG's desk. Because the more complaints they get, the more you are on their radar. Surf days. The FEA actually has something called, we can take questions in one minute, surf days, where they actually sit on, at the computer and look at websites that are deceptive and, and making claims that they shouldn't be making. They have people devoted to this. So they're going to look out for you. Private litigants. Uh, you know, there haven't been too many products liability cases um, regarding dietary supplements of late, but private litigants are going to be the ones who are going to get you into trouble because they're not only going to sue you on their own, they're going to join a class and sue you as a class action. And then your competitors. Either your competitors rat you out to the FTC or FDA, I've seen that happen, or your sloppy competitors are doing something that reflects badly on you. Um, and so if one person in the industry is doing something bad, the entire industry comes under scrutiny. So those are the ways that you can land in hot water. Um, and if it, we could just leave you with one point before we get to questions is spending a little money now can save you a lot of money later. So make sure you're compliant, check in with counsel, make sure you're doing everything correctly. It's worth the investment. Questions? You want to use the microphone? Or you could talk loudly and I'll repeat it. I was wondering, are they considering the size of the company? They consider to having this on 50 complaints from customers? Let's say you have 10,000 customers, you have 50 complaints. That's not a lot. But if you have 500 customers, then you can be pretty significant. Are they here? I'm just going to repeat the question. The question is, does the FCC take into consideration the size of the company um, and the number of complaints they get? So if you have a company that has 50 complaints with 10,000 consumers, is that considered to be a lot? Or does the FTC even take that into consideration? Uh, the FTC will take that into consideration. I mean, and that's certainly an argument that you can, that a company could make. I mean, no, nobody's perfect and companies aren't perfect. So if you had complaints, uh, but you had a very large consumer base, right, you might be able to make that argument. But, but two things. One, what you just said is, if, if you have a lot of complaints, right, consumer complaints and a lot of consumer complaints lead to regulatory action, state level or federal. Right? So if you have a lot of complaints relative to your customer base, then, then you have a problem. Second, it depends a little bit on the type of complaint, right? Even a small number of complaints could spark um, regulatory action. For example, if you get a number of complaints of people saying, you know, I I'm seeing charges on my credit card bill that I just don't remember authorizing. They seem strange to me. And those make it, those could spark an investigation because the fact that there aren't a lot of them, right? wouldn't necessarily cause, it. the FTC might think, well, yeah, these are the only people, these are the people that noticed, right? This may be a widespread problem. Um, so it depends a little bit sometimes on the nature of the complaint. Anyone else have questions? Yes? Uh, thanks for the good background. I feel like I'm well equipped to start my own future super <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> uh, I was kind of curious, because I, I see a lot of companies or some companies making claims that they use the future super or other companies making the claim function, right? Um, that kind of I think it's a drug claim. I think you shouldn't be making those when you're marketing dietary supplements. And I think it's you're getting into territory that you don't want to be in because. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't advise on using that in your advertising. I, I think that the term nutraceutical in itself is not probably a great term to use as well. Although there's not, like I said, there's no legal definition of what nutraceutical is. So. There's no chance that someone's going to come and say you're, you're a drug versus a dietary supplement. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't make any comparisons to pharmacy quality drugs or, or use the term drug at all in your advertising. And sometimes what people do too, which I think is equally problematic, while a manufacturing facility has to be approved by the FDA, people try to blur the line a little bit and sort of suggest that because their supplement was uh, 
manufactured an FDA-approved facility, that that somehow means, right, that the FDA has also signed off on the effects of the particular product. And that can be a, that can be a problem, right, if you are, exactly. uh, if you're designing your marketing materials to sort of give that impression. And that's where that disclaimer will come in handy, the, the FDA disclaimer, so when you're making you're that kind of impression. Mm -hmm. And they, it's just not before they come to us and they can submit. You said earlier that we need to make sure that these are good people. Is that enough for we actually then decide to say that I take the product that I lost weight? I would do a testimonial form, is kind of what I advise my clients to do is get them to sign up on a form. Um, you know, testifying to the fact that these are true statements that they're making uh, and uh, attest to that. And make sure that when you're using before and after pictures to qualify them. How long before and after were they? Was it two months, two years? Um, and then include the uh, average or typical disclaimer of what other consumers can expect to achieve. That only protects you, right? And, and right. It's, a, it's a good practice, right? If you have consumers that like your product and are voluntarily sending you pictures and, and testimonials, uh, these aren't very complicated forms, these sort of these affidavits. I guess they don't even need to be affidavits. No, it's just a page. Just a, just yeah. a testimonial form, right? Um, will uh, protect you or your company in case somebody comes along, a regulatory agency comes along and says, I don't believe that these are real consumers. That would be very compelling evidence, right, that they in fact are. So I think they're about to kick us out, um, but we are available for questions. If you have them, we'll step outside. I left some business cards and some uh, handouts for you all at the end of your desk. Please feel free to take one, and we appreciate your attendance today. Thanks for coming.